Good morning and welcome to the High North Dialogue Conference 2022. We are the first side event taking off at the conference. There will be a lot of side events during the day uh, and you could find them in the program. And many of them are also open for you who are digitally connected. But in this side event, we focus on China. And no others, we could take the presentation. Yes. And uh, as you know, many of you, we have a very good and interesting project called China in the Arctic, external influence on regional governance. Um, and we will use the, these two hours to this project. Maybe we will not need both these hours, but my experience is that sometimes we even need more time, but we have two hours, that is the maximum. And we will have uh, some presentations. I will say a little about the project and what it is about and how we have been thinking in building up the project. And after that, we will have four presentations from the project. And uh, two of them will be here from this room and two will be uh, made digitally uh, from Oslo. And I hope that we could ask questions during that presentation. So we should feel open for that. And we have a chat function that should function so that you could also put questions there. And in this small room, we could even be able to, to, to come with the questions from the room, from the hall, and we could have a discussion. Uh, but we could also at the end have a more broader discussion if we feel free for that. So then I will say a little about the project and as you could see the background is that the Norwegian Research Council they were so generous in financing uh, this project most of it is financed from the Norwegian Research Council from the polar uh, uh, program and the project is very wisely put together I would say uh, but it's interestingly because 50 percent of the scientific orientations, uh, orientation is connected to business and management, and 50% is connected to political science. And Noor University Business School and the High North Center at Noor University Business School is the manager of the project, and we are mostly uh, um, uh, doctors in business and management. And the other uh, partners are mostly in political science, and the partners are the uh, Fitch of Nonsense Institute and the Arctic Institute, East China Normal University, Shanghai Institutes for International Studies, and uh, Hokkaido University Arctic Research Center. So we are quite a, a, an interesting group. Sadly, we have not been able to meet physically because of the pandemic situation. But we are waiting very much forward to that. And we had even a plan to go to China in the fall, but um, it will not be able. To, but we hope for the next spring. Uh, and of course, these meetings where we are, are, are uh, discussing digitally, they are important, but also to have more time and sit together uh, to discuss more deeply is uh, we are looking very much forward to that. And the project came in, I will say it started with a discussion between FNI and us at um, in the High North Center, and it was very much climate change oriented. And then we came into Arctic governance, and then we came into countries outside the Arctic. Uh, and as you all know, China is outside the Arctic. But what we know is that the Arctic is warming three times faster uh, than what is the global average, meaning that the climate change is very visible in the Arctic. And just to make it sure for all, it does not have so much to do with pollution and these things in the Arctic. It has to do with the, 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 the air streams uh, so that the melting process in the Arctic is much, much stronger. Um, and it means that the consequences of the climate change is very strong in the Arctic. But the Arctic is not uh, close from the rest of the world when it comes to the impact of 
what what uh, the impact of these climate changes. So it means that quite many other countries than the Arctic countries are interested in understanding what is going on in the Arctic because it could have quite many consequences from for them. So therefore, the Arctic states and also other stakeholders in the Arctic, they have made different uh, governance structures uh, to try to, to meet the demand that the climate change is, is uh, asking for and setting for, but also to make sure that the Arctic is developed in a sustainable way. But then also other countries outside the Arctic say that they would like to take part in the governance uh, structures of the Arctic, and especially the Arctic Council has been uh, has been very uh, interesting uh, for many other countries. And there are, I think, today thirty four or something like that observers to the Arctic Council, so, and China is one of them. So China has quite a, a, a an important interest in the Arctic, and then the research questions are something like this. Does China influence on Arctic governance institutions and eventually how? And, and we know that they does influence in the way that they are observers, but we will go deeper into that and see how is this influence? Is it putting more questions, other questions? Is it making it more openly for discussion? Uh, how is it? And that we will, we will study. And then we will also study how such an EA influence may also have an impact on the governance institutions, the Arctic Council, the Arctic Economic Council, and, and so on. Uh, I, I can see there is a problem with, with that. Uh, now we will be back with the camera. Um, uh, so, so we are asking, is China influencing on the Arctic governance institutions? What is the impact for the Arctic governance institutions. And could it be like this, that if China is active, and we know about the China's uh, Arctic policy, uh, if they are active, will that also influence other countries, for instance, Japan and, and South Korea and, and all around the world? So that is the main questions. So, and we have a model that is always changing. <laughs> we, we are researchers, so we know that our models are that to be changed. But the idea is that uh, how is the Chinese influence um, and effects on Arctic governance mechanisms? And of course, uh, of course the, the influence could be on initiatives that China, that is outside the Arctic, could take other initiatives than the Arctic states. And they could have some of the same intentions, but the intentions could even lead to other kinds of discussions than what we would have if it was only the Arctic states. And of course, it could also be pressures that it, we know that the consequences of the climate change could be extreme for some of the Asian countries. And of course, they, they will then work to, to prevent that and the other such uh, influence. And the effects, they could be economical and they could be also organizational. So that is the model that we have and we have three work packages in the, in the project. Uh, one is focusing on the international level, the law of the sea and the Arctic. And uh, Iseline Stensal, who will have a presentation later, um, she is uh, the leader of that work package. Then we have work package two that is focusing on the regional level. And you should notice that with the region, we think about the Arctic region. So it is not uh, a country or something like that, but it's Arctic Council and it's high uh, Arctic Fisheries Agreement and that kind of regional um, uh, focus. And Sven Rotem from FNI uh, is a leader for that. And we will also meet Sven later today in, in, in this uh, side event. And then we have the third work package. And we at the Heinrich Center at New University Business School is um, and responsible for the work in that work package. And there we are focusing much on investments on, and more economic uh, structures and economic effects. And we will also have a presentation from that, or we will have two presentations co connected to that um, uh, work package. 
And then we hope to make a synthesis. Uh, we are, are already discussing how we could do that. Uh, and the idea is that we also shall have a book. So there will be a lot of articles. I hope you will hear some about that today and look forward to 2025. Then the book should be there. And if you would like to follow us in the project, we have our own website, arco.no. And there we will put news, we will put also the articles uh, from today so that it's easy to access us and, and, and to, to learn about what we are doing. And then we are ready for the presentations. And we will start with Iseline Stenstall uh, from the Fitch of Nonsense Institute, uh, Arctic Waters and Global Governance Institution, China and UNCLOS, the paragraph 234. Uh, I must call her code. Thereafter, Svein Rotten from also the Fitch um, uh, of Nonsense Institute will uh, give a presentation observing the Arctic Council, the role of China. Thereafter, it will be Anders Erdström from the Heinrich Center, New University, uh, making a presentation about the paper that he is developing, uh, development of Chinese investments in the Arctic. And the last presentation will be done by uh, Trim Eiteryu uh, from the Arctic Institute, and that is the Arctic in China's uh, 14th five years plan. So that is the outline for today. And I don't think I will open for questions. No, if you have questions that are more related to the project and so on, I think we could take them later because then you will know a little more about the project from the presentations that you have been been listening to and, and that you have also uh, seen pictures from. So then I think on the right that you have to make sure that th that camera is functioning. Um, but now, Iseline, are you yes. ready? The camera is ready. Very good. Then I hand over the, the microphone and everything to you. Thank you. So, Iseline. You are very much welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you virtually, hopefully next year, uh, also in person. Um, yeah, so as Frude said, our projects are concerns how does China as an external actor to the Arctic actually influence Arctic governance? And uh, what's the work package, the part of the project that, that I'm working on, we're looking at the international level. Uh, and I must say that this is very preliminary work um, due to COVID and long COVID, and we started a bit later than we uh, expected first uh, last year. Um, but I think it's also actually a good time to, to present because uh, then we can get some good feedback and have a, have a good discussion before we <clears throat> before we move on with, uh, with doing the nitty gritty work of, uh, of, the, of the research. Anyways, so I just wanted to remind us or everyone uh, that in 2018, China published uh, a white paper um, sort of presented its official Arctic policy. Um, now we see the four goals that are stated in this uh, in this paper, and there's to understand the Arctic, to protect the Arctic, to develop the Arctic, and to participate in Arctic governance. Uh, if we go back to the developing the Arctic, um, that means transportation, technology, and resources. Uh, and transportation in the Arctic means shipping. So that we had sort of already identified shipping as an Arctic interest for China. Um, that made it um, sort of, that was um, directional for, for choosing uh, the law of the sea and looking at the, that kind of international uh, regulations. Yes, so uh, I brought up two maps. Um, well, speaking for myself at least, when I think of, uh, of Arctic shipping, uh, I think of the Northern Sea Route. Uh, but as we see, there is also, of course, the Northwest Passage. And well, I mean, it looks like the ice is melting, so more possible Iseline, than... Iseline, can you hear yes. me? I think we have a problem with the slides. No, okay, yeah, really. Uh, you, you mentioned two maps and we and are And you're not, not there, seeing right? anyone. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so what are you seeing? We are seeing the, the first slide. 
Only the first slide. Okay. Yes. Um, could we then maybe Anush, I can stop sharing my screen and you could uh, you could pull it up. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'll stop um, stop share. Okay. Well. Very good. Uh, such is life. Yes. Thank you. So. Well, then you can go. I guess. Thank you. Uh, and we can let's let's go back to the to the China's Arctic policy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just so uh, I know I, I sort of sped through it a bit quickly, uh, but to understand, protect, develop, and participate, uh, and uh, in governance. And I think our our attention sort of came to the developing and and the shipping part. Thank you. Now please go to the to the map. Yes, <clears throat> so, um, okay, good. Now you can see the maps, right? Yes, we yes. see it very clear. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, so, so shipping is uh, identified as an Arctic interest, but we're not interested, <laughs> interested uh, in the interest, right? Uh, our research focus is sort of how is China uh, affecting um, governance? Uh, and uh, I assume you heard of the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, so this was um, um, launched by President Xi Jinping in 2013. And afterwards, the years passing, it kind of grew a bit. Uh, so that in June 2017, sort of six months before the Arctic policy was published, there was a document um, issued uh, in China that also sort of stated that now we consider the Arctic to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the roads are land. Uh, and um, uh, the belts are, are sort of the seaways. Uh, and you might have heard of the Polar Silk Road. So, so that is, um, that is uh, yeah, um, the, the, the Chinese interest. Uh, but we're, of course, interested in, in, uh, in how, uh, in the, in the government, uh, governance mechanism. Can I have next slide, please? Yes, thank you. So. How, how is uh, the Arctic governed? Uh, Fru also touched on, uh, on that. The Arctic countries themselves, the Arctic Council, which Sven will talk more about. Uh, and then we also have you know, international agreements that are global, but uh, that have specifically um, uh, parts that are specific to, to polar areas. Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. Good, yes. Um, uh, I, I have not made this myself. Uh, it's from the Heinrich Böll uh, Stiftung. It's, I, I just think it's quite interesting to have it visualized uh, <laughs> how, how our maritime zones governed. Uh, and the orange part um, and internal waters, uh, they're not even mentioned. That will be closest to the shore. But uh, the orange part is, is governed by the, by the coastal states, by the Arctic states. Uh, and uh, the part of the ocean that would be high seas and that's sort of covered in blue. Uh, that's where international law of the sea um, applies. Uh, yes, so uh, let's look at, uh, next slide please. So uh, for, for the law of the sea convention, there are two principles uh, that I'm, I'm not gonna do a whole sort of uh, history of the convention, but there are two principles that are, um, sort of foundational uh, to the convention. And one is freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation. Um, that, you know, uh, there should be uh, a lot to, to travel the seas. Uh, on the other hand, a very uh, important principle too is the jurisdiction of the coastal state. And, and those two um, considerations sometimes uh, are in a bit opposition to each other. Now, um, and the um, article 234 governing, governing ice covered areas, uh, it has sort of the same, um, the, the same um, two principles kind of possibly clashing a little bit. One is of course that uh, navigation in ice covered areas. And the other one is uh, to prevent pollution. Can I have the next slide please? Yeah, thank you. So this is the full article uh, two, three, four. 
uh, and I'm not going to read uh, everything, but I, I wanted to draw attention to the following that I put in italics. So the coastal state uh, has the right to adopt uh, extra laws, non-discriminatory um, and regulations uh, within the limits of its exclusive economic zone. So that would be the, uh, that we saw in the, the figure, the orange part uh, of, uh, of the sea. And to my understanding, so far it's um, only Russia and Canada that have used Article 234 to uh, adopt more severe um, regulations. Next slide, please. Yes, <clears throat> the International Maritime Organization. So the International Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters, which is uh, known for short as the Polar Code. Um, so this is a, is a standards of extra, uh, extra standards concerning construction, training, equipment, voyage planning, pollution, and communications uh, standards for commercial ships operating in polar waters. And the reason there is a polar code is that it's just an acknowledgement that you know, polar waters are, have harsh conditions. So the requirements for ships should be a bit higher than just sort of the, the global standard. And uh, IMO is a specialized agency of the plus. So, uh, so the, um, legally, um, they are a bit different. However, experts, I'm, I'm not a lawyer myself, but from what I've read, experts uh, deem that the polar code qualify as the generally accepted international rules and standards. Yes, so, so far so good. Uh, and that kind of leads us to uh, the research. Next slide, please. Uh, to the questions that we uh, will dive deeper into. Um, so how does China actually view the UNCLOS and the polar code in the Arctic? Um, what type of navigation do we see? Because you know the, the convention and, and the code, they were already negotiated, they're, they're there. So most likely how we can, um, how we can study uh, China's uh, effect on, 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 on Arctic governance is how, how China deals with and how it uh, sort of views uh, these types of regulations. Uh, and I think also it would be um, quite useful to also look at uh, what, what is the Chinese state sort of preparing for. Um, can I have, can, Anish, can you go back to the, to the map, number three? Yeah, thank you. Because as I as I drew your attention to the, the ice covered areas, right? So that's only in the economic zone, which would be along the coast. However, uh, if I mean, just traversing the Arctic Ocean is the most cost effective, it's the most efficient. Uh, and I mean, maybe not by 2025 when our project wraps up, but looks like likely in the future that there will be less and less ice. Uh, so perhaps then the Central Arctic route will be the most, um, well, will be the most desirable route um, of choice. And then, you know, the Article 234 will be less applicable. Um, yeah, and um, that's, I think I'm just going to stop here. And the effect uh, of, of China on the Arctic governance is sort of for the, uh, the synthesis part. So um, I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. I think we should have a call. Yeah. Maybe you could go back to the questions there, yep. because I think I think that, that they were very very good questions. Um, are, are there any questions here or in in uh, in the chat? Can we see the questions in the chat? I'm not very good in this, do you know? Uh, we want to ask Andre. I think he's monitoring the chat. Chat, yes. Yes. So, so we have to ask that. Are there any questions here? If not, uh, maybe I could start asking you uh, a question. I, I think this is very, very interesting. Um, but and you mentioned, uh, as I, I heard, that it was only Russia and Canada that had put some more strict regulations. Uh, how are they strict? In what kind of ways are they they they're stricter than the the, the, the more overall um, uh, regulations? 
Uh, to be honest, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I know that the, I know I know that there are sort of a put in place for for to prevent pollution, but uh, I've not dived very deeply into that yet. Okay, and and but you don't know anything about whether uh, you, have, you have had Chinese reaction on that because we, I don't know anything about these regulations. But if they are differently in in Canada and in in Russia, maybe China has also act differently on them, but maybe you have not been into that. No, I haven't. That's actually a good uh, good point. Uh, I, I haven't heard any sort of special Chinese reactions, um, but uh, that's something I can look into, definitely. Thank you. Okay, Andre, do you see if there are any in the chat? No. There are no in the chat. Could okay, I ask you one question? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Hi, Islin. Nice to see Hi. you. Um, I just wonder, uh, what's your first impression? Uh, has there been any Chinese activities on these questions? I, I find uh, this uh, focus very interesting and relevant. Um, but do you have like, I know that you haven't digged deep into this uh, uh, now, but um, do you have an, well, what kind of um, role has China or if any role at all played in these <laughs> negotiations? Do you have any, well, first impressions? Uh, yes, thank you, Sven. Um, well, the thing is, um, China always, and I think that's true in the in the white paper on the Arctic policy as well. It kind of upholds the the UN system as the as the main governing international system. Uh, so very supportive, uh, and also, of course, to become a member of the Arctic Council, they had to sort of. Uh, re-emphasize uh, the uh, oh, I, I forgot the, the the sovereignty sovereignty of uh, of the Arctic states, and that also sort of extends to the to the oceans as well. Uh, so we we don't have any indications that they're sort of opposing or that they're undermining the system or anything. Uh, and as for the <clears throat> negotiations for the polar code. I have not really looked into that in depth myself. Uh, however, I did speak to to someone who wrote their uh, PhD, uh, focusing mostly on Russia. And as she pointed out, uh, there are translators for the uh, for the main sessions, but a lot uh, happened, uh, you know, uh, in, informally after the official sessions, uh, and and then there were no translators. So she said, if, you know, for the countries that were not fluent in English, uh, they struggled. Uh, so I can imagine that probably be a challenge for, for the Chinese delegation as well. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point because there are always these um, odd things that makes a difference, really. So and mm. we, I, I think we all as researchers has, has to be aware of, well, one person or a translation, lost in translation and so and stuff like that. So uh, I think that's, a, that's an interesting finding in itself. Yeah. Uh, but um, addressing these issues, it's not a lot of Chinese shipping in the Arctic. So that's maybe why they are not that eager. So, uh, well, uh, shipping uh, from uh, Yamal is, is clearly of importance, but that's something different than the trans-Arctic shipping. So um, I think that's important to bear in mind, but um, very, very interesting questions. And um, uh, finally, someone digging deeply into Chinese activities and understandings and not on, only broad analysis, so um, very yes. concrete and good. Thank you for yeah, because that's that's a very good point, um, and that has happened in previous projects also when we looked at China and the Arctic. That you know um, how much activity is there, <laughs> mm. uh, but uh, and that's why I sort of also included, you know, what what they're what they're they're looking to in the future. Um, I know there's um, oh, so we're in 2022, so maybe this year actually uh, that they're planning to the. Chinese side is planning to uh, uh, launch a satellite um, to help with um, satellite uh, um, communications in the Arctic for, for ships. Uh, I'm also thinking that we could look at sort of uh, the order books, what kind of ships are being ordered. Uh, of course, if there are no, no ice class uh, ships being built uh, from the Chinese side at all, uh, that's quite indicative. Um, yeah. Thank you very, very much, um, Iseline.
Um, are there any more questions or Sven? Are there anything more you would like us to discuss here with the Iselin? Mm -hmm. Then I, I think we, we thank you, Iselin, and you. we are looking very much forward to the, the next part of that. So one more applause. And then we go to the next presentation, and that is Sven Rotem. And then we go directly into the Arctic Council and the role of China. So Sven, um, the floor and the microphone is yours. And as I, I forgot to say to Iselin, that you should present yourself. I'm not very good at presenting people. Uh, so, so say a few <laughs> words about yourself, uh, Sven, and, and then, then the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Frode. Very nice to see, well, some of you. I'm, I'm, I'm in Bode this evening, so, but I had to be, well, home today because I have a sick child. So, <laughs> so but traveling to Bode later this, uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Svein Wieland Rottem, uh, and I'm a senior researcher at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, uh, working, well, with all kinds of Arctic issues, really, but uh, my main field of interest has been the Arctic Council, and I've published uh, articles, books, and so on and so forth uh, on, on the Arctic Council for, well, a decade now. So I'm founder of the Arctic Council, and I think the Arctic Council is important. But in this, um, well, Dark times, really. The Arctic Council is also affected clearly by what's happening in Ukraine. So I think it's it's really um, uh, we have to bear that in mind when we're discussing Arctic issues, also. But um, for now, I'll, I'll I'll dig deeper into the to the role of the uh, observers in the Arctic Council. Uh, first, I, I don't have the PowerPoint slides. I'm not that uh, well. well Sometimes uh, the, the format is better for, for not having that, but uh, some uh, variation is really good. So very nice slice, Islin. <laughs> uh, but first we need to understand the role of the observers to understand what kind of role the China, ha China has in, in the Arctic Council. First, uh, the role of those observers in the Arctic Council has been discussed since the start of the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, the AEPS, in 1991, and what became the Arctic Council in 1996. The status uh, by which the Council was to be governed were adopted at a ministerial meeting in Canada in 1998. A key point is really that all decisions in the forum and, on, and, and in the underlying working groups must, mean, must be made by consensus among the eight member states, the Arctic states, and only member states and permanent participants, that the indigenous peoples groups, can make proposals for new projects. Thus, the role of the observers is primarily to observe. Nevertheless, we have to make a distinction between the senior Arctic official level and the working group level. At the senior Arctic uh, uh, official level, observers have limited influence. We have occasionally seen that observers have exaggerated uh, expectations about what role they can play in the Arctic Council. And the senior Arctic uh, the senior Arctic officials uh, have also been keen to give a realistic picture of how observers can participate. The observers may nevertheless propose new projects through the member states or through the permanent participants. But again, their primary role is to provide input to and work within the projects that the Council has already approved. That means what is taking place in the working groups of the Arctic Council. And this limited opportunity for, for influence has occasionally caused frustration and may also have led to limited commitment uh, to the Council's works on the behalf of the uh, non-Arctic states or the observers. Uh, furthermore, despite the fact that the role of the observers has been debated since the start uh, of the Arctic Council, it was not until uh, the ministerial meeting in Kiruna in 2013 that the issue was at the top of the agenda. At this meeting, China, Japan, India, Singapore, and South Korea were granted observer status. However, also in 2013, uh, Russia and Canada were in part very skeptical of China as a new observer. But they chose at the meeting in Kiruna to uh, give China observer status. Uh, 
this um, interest, this broad interest in the Arctic Council among uh, non-Arctic states, including China, must be seen in light of the increased international interest in, the, in Arctic issues in general, and especially in the period from 2007 to 2010, the great Arctic debate was centered around issues like conflict versus cooperation, potential militarization of the region, the untapped resources, uh, and new sailing routes. Uh, and in this um, discourse, and in this huge debate on the Arctic, the criteria for incorporating new observers and the procedures for their participation were outlined in a senior Arctic uh, official report to the ministerial meeting in Nuuk in 2011 and elaborated in the revised Arctic Council rules of procedures and the Arctic Council observer manual adopted at the ministerial meeting in Kiruna in 2013. And here it was emphasized that the observer's most important role is part participation in the working groups. As you all know, the Arctic Council has six working groups uh, addressing different important issues uh, in, in the Arctic, be that climate change, uh, environmental pollutants, uh, search and rescue, and so on and so forth. Um, in order to determine observers' suitability, several criteria are being considered. A web are still being considered and were considered when applying for observer status. There are three in particular who deserve attention. And this was also highlighted by Islin. First, observer states must recognize the legal framework that applies in the Arctic, the law or the sea. Very important point that I was fundamental uh, when uh, China was grant, granted observer status in 2013. The second point is that observers must be able to demonstrate relevant Arctic expertise. And clearly, there's a huge room for uh, interpretation here, since relevant Arctic expertise is a vague term and can be so many things, really. A final point that is, uh, is uh, addressed by uh, the Arctic Council member states is that observers shall contribute to the strengthening of the work of the permanent participants the indigenous working groups, the indigenous uh, people. And what we have seen really is that the Arctic Council has clarified the requirements for observers in the last 10 years. So it's been a huge development since 2011 and until now. And this has been like, a, a, this has gone from a fairly informal and liberal practice in terms of presence, also at the senior Arctic official level to a fairly to fairly clear guidelines for the participation uh, in the Arctic Council. However, this process has not ended yet. Uh, there are several arguments for observers for, for, for should be included in the Arctic Council's work. First, they can contribute to an increased awareness of the challenges facing the Arctic. And furthermore, and very important really, it, it makes it easier for non-Arctic researchers uh, to contribute their expertise and especially in the working groups. A final uh, and important argument is that the majority of Arctic challenges, as you mentioned through the, are global in character, such as climate change, pollutants and shipping. And these are challenges that can only be solved globally and not only between the eight members of the council. So Arctic issues are global issues and thus uh, observers with relevant expertise uh, uh, should also be included is the argument from the Arctic council and its uh, member states. The arguments against uh, including more observers are both practical and political in nature. As for the practical Practicalities, and this is may seem kind of odd, but it's it's all, it's it's an important element. Is that most Arctic Council meetings are often held in places far away from the beaten track. It's just hard to get there. Meeting facilities can also can make meeting facilities that can make room for for all participants and observers may also be in short supply. Uh, and this has also been, in fact, used as an argument uh, to limit the numbers of observers. When it comes to the political, we can make a distinction between two main challenges. First, there has been a fear among the permanent participants 
that a large number of, of observers will lead to a marginalization of the indigenous voice in the Arctic Council. And clearly, and secondly, geopolitical unrest and classical real political thinking have also influenced the discussion, the discussion on whether, whether one should include new observers. And as mentioned, several states, and in particular Canada and Russia, were skeptical about involving China in Arctic cooperation. But they were included in 2013. In, in our work, and I say our work because um, me and Göril is writing an article uh, on, on these matters, on uh, the role of China in, as an observer in the Arctic Council, we ask two questions. First, we ask, how is Chinese activities in the Arctic Council perceived by the members of the Arctic Council, be that both civil servants and researchers, but also at the political level? How is China perceived by um, the members of, of the Arctic Council? And secondly, and maybe most interesting and harder to dig into really, is how is part participation in the Arctic Council portrayed by Chinese researchers and civil servants. What do China get out of this cooperation? And luckily, um, my colleague Gödel is fluently in Chinese, so I can uh, well, I can I can do this uh, European part, and uh, and, and Gödel can do the Chinese um, interviews. But first, and as I mentioned, uh, my question to Islin was: such there has been a lot of analysis of the observer's role in the Arctic Council, but they have often been like um, uh, mapping how much activity and not doing in-depth analysis of states as such. So, so this kind of analysis has never, as I, to my knowledge, never been conducted before. Uh, at the moment, uh, Gary and I are now mapping relevant areas for cooperation. Where do China uh, actually play a role in the Arctic Council? And the next phase and the most important phase in, this, in our project, well, writing our article, is uh, conducting in-depth interviews with uh, key members of the working groups and the Arctic Council and Chinese uh, researchers and civil servants. So um, very interesting and cool project really so I'm glad to be included uh, in this so and uh, that was all for now thank you very much if not Gödel has something to add but maybe she could use she could do, do that in 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 the discussion thank you oh, oh thank you very much uh, very interesting and Gödel if you would like to add something you should feel free to that and if there are questions also in the room or in the chat, we can take them. And because of the technical solutions, we can't see the chat because we are connected directly here. But I've heard rumors that there are a few questions and maybe we could take them at the end after all uh, the presentations because I think that will, will be easier. Uh, but Gurir, will you like to add something to what Sven said? Then you should feel free to do that. Hello, <clears throat> can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you very clear and see you okay. too. Well, I think uh, Svein has presented very clearly what we are doing in this project and um, especially, you know, to see uh, some of um, the possibilities for, for China and the Chinese uh, particip participants in the working groups, you know, to contribute to what the Arctic Council is doing in, in the Arctic. And we do already, we know about the few areas that where China would be very, um, um, how should I say, have um, has a lot of expertise. You know, for instance, mercury issue is something that has um, been important in, for instance, the bilateral relations between Norway and China, for instance, a long-term project. And also black carbon has also become a project of um, collaboration between Norway and China, for instance, so these, both of these areas uh, would uh, be, um, you know, have synergies with the China's um, domestic policies, environmental policies, which is a good thing. And Svein very rightly said, you know, these issues are global issues and climate change, of course, is something that uh, China is uh, very much um, concerned about. And uh, also, 
using, I mean, saying that uh, the Arctic, the climate, climatic changes in the Arctic is actually very much um, influencing China's uh, climatic uh, changes as well. So there are many um, uh, ways that China also could contribute uh, fully into the working groups. And I know that they are, and there is an observer report that I found on the Arctic Council website. And it seems quite a bit of, I mean, quite a few scientists are involved in the working groups and from different uh, universities um, and um, um, research institutes in, in China. So, but uh, it's very interesting that um, we need to find out a little bit more what uh, China is uh, thinking or the Chinese uh, participants um, are thinking about the, the participation in, in uh, the working groups of the Arctic Council. So, yes, thanks a lot. And it's a um, really interesting project that we're looking forward to getting much deeper into now as we you know, are uh, concluding some other uh, projects or things at first. <laughs> so thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guril. And but maybe I could ask you both uh, because I, I like so very much these interesting questions that you ended up with uh, saying uh, where you will go deeper into how is the Arctic uh, Council perceived, uh, both from the political level or, or the ministry level, and also from researchers. And and, and then Guril will do the same on the on on, on the Chinese side. But uh, but uh, do you have any kind of of, of expectations that the Arctic countries, the uh, Arctic states could have different perceptions or different understandings. Because as you said, Sven, uh, that uh, Russia and US, that they were more, uh, let's say, they were not so very eager to include China. They, they had questions, but they, they said yes, uh, even though. So, so I was wondering, do, have you any kind of expectations? Do you know anything about the debates going on? I'm not thinking right now because now the debate is so very much influenced by by, by the situation um, in, in Ukraine, but more in general. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I think to answer that question, we have to firstly bear in mind that the Arctic Council is not a legal body. It cannot make rules. So that's important. So I think a key message in the start of our article in, or in our research is to try to explain what kind of uh, body the Arctic Council is. And the Arctic Council is primarily an institution that provides knowledge to other relevant areas uh, and other international uh, agreements. Uh, one example could be, as Gerl mentioned, how the Arctic Council, the work mm, make compiles and makes science available that are relevant to conclude and agree on international agreements. So it's not a legal body in it as such. All uh, the recommendations from the Arctic Council are political recommendations. And I think, uh, and I think that's, that's important to bear in mind because the Arctic Council is part of a regime complex in, in the region. And it's not like the law, the sea, telling what to do and what not to do in, in, in the region. So I think it's a kind of, a, we have to, I think that it might be to some extent that uh, among some of the member states in the Arctic Council, they have been reluctant of other reasons than the Arctic governance in itself, but more in a political uh, sense that they are afraid of um, the geopolitical tense situation in the world as such. So it's not about the Arctic Council as such, it's about an understanding of whether to include a state or not. And I think another important message from, especially from Norway, when when, the, when China, Singapore, Japan, and, and so on were, were accepted as observers, was that if we include the observers, well, that was the thinking from the, from the Arctic states, if we include other non-Arctic states in the work of the Arctic Council, they will not um, establish a, a club on, this, on the side of the Arctic Council and make their own club, really. So it's important to have them inside, then it's easier. And again, it's very important to stress that to be an observer, you have to uh, obey to the law of the sea in, in, in the Arctic, a key, key element, especially for Russia when, uh, when China was included in, in 2013. And the same goes for Norway. Uh, so, um, but my, and, and secondly, my feeling is really that, uh, and I, I'm, I think there is a, 
many think that China is doing a lot in the Arctic Council. I might. I, I'm maybe not that sure of that. So I think we, on, on some issue areas like mercury and black carbon uh, and migratory birds, there are very mm, interesting initiatives. But uh, in the Arctic Council as such, as, a, as, a, as an international <laughs> forum, I think the, the role they play is kind of um, minor. But um, only research can tell us uh, whether China, how, how China is perceived in the Arctic Council and how they perceive their role. I think, but as you say, uh, for now it's important, it's very difficult to make a substantial analysis of this because of uh, the war in Ukraine. So that's my main take on it. Mm. Thank you very much, Svein. And um, are there any last questions or comments? If not, maybe there are in the chat, and then we will come back to that at the end because that will be the most uh, practical way of doing that. So, so yeah, uh, we have one question here. So, speak loud. Hi, Sven. This is Tina uh, from Heiner's News. Uh, I kind of got hung up in what you said uh, that you uh, the Arctic Council included China, so that these kind of states would not make their own kind of Arctic club on the outside. What was the thinking here? Was it sort of keep your enemies closer? What, what kind of work would a Chinese and other countries sort of society have done outside that would have affected the Arctic in a bad way? Um, very, very interesting and kind of difficult question. The quote was really from Espen Bart Aida. Uh, okay. then Ministry of Foreign Affairs and he was uh, and that was important in in the Norwegian Ministry of Affairs when accepting uh, China and I think m maybe that thinking was well mm, not that realistic really but, but, but what kind of club could that be really I, I don't know uh, um, but um, I think on the other hand including um observer was not that dangerous at all and uh, and i think that was something that was um, slowly recognized in the norwegian ministry of foreign affairs that this is more a win-win situation where we can well make platforms for bilateral cooperation on on issues where we have common ground really and uh, the arctic council is not a hard policy body so so we can only do soft policy, and that is um, makes um, it's an excellent arena for uh, for working together with states that you might differ uh, on other geopolitical issues. So it's an easy arena to find some sort of common ground, really. So I, I think we, we could discuss that later today as well, Tina. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sven. Then we give Sven and Bernard a, a big applause. Yeah, we very much forward to the papers to come. So, so and, and also you train to come to Buda. That will be great. <laughs> okay, then we continue. And the next is really the, 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 the man who is uh, taking care of all practical things in our project and a lot of other things too. And that is Anders um, um, Elström uh, from the High North Center at New University. And the presentation is about the state of the art development on Chinese investment in the Arctic. So the floor is yours, Anders. Thank you very much, Rude, for giving me the word. And thank you for the opportunity to present my work and project with all of you. I'm going to open my presentation and share it with you now. Let me see. Share, share, and start. From the beginning. So what I will do now is to present uh, the um, the project that I'm working with for my PhD thesis, and I will give the background of what I thought about the process of the PhD and the questions that they're asking and methodology, and then I will zoom into the first paper that I'm going to develop. Uh, because this is really what is on my mind now and where I need some help from you, which I will ask for a bit later, if possible. So the research questions 
for the PHP under the work package three. And I will remind you that the work package three is about the national level, the national Arctic level. Um, how does China cooperate with this uh, in uh, investments and in educational cooperation and in cooperation with the regional counties and municipalities and so on. And my PhD will focus very much on investments. So business investments, what are they actually doing? And the first question is, what are the drivers and motivations for Chinese uh, investments in Norway and in the Arctic? And are there any special characteristics connected to these Chinese investments in the Arctic? What, what is typical for a Chinese investment? Is there anything different, for instance, between an Arctic investment and just an ordinary investment somewhere else in the world? What are the characteristics? And number three, uh, which Chinese and Norwegian actors are involved and how are they involved? Uh, for instance, could it be uh, just the companies? Could it be official government? Could it be uh, chambers of commerce? Or who are actually involved in this process of having Chinese investments in the Arctic? And then the fourth one, can these investments contribute to or influence on the Arctic governance mechanisms. And here we do have some, a lot of definitions to be made because not everything is yet decided. Like what, what is actually an Arctic governance mechanisms when it comes to investments? How are these built? What are the systems? Uh, and also what is actually influence? Is it something that you, um, is it something that you just make slightly different, or is it something that you cooperate with to develop? So it's we are also deciding on uh, influence or contribution to the Arctic governance mechanisms. And this results in five different parts of the PhD project. The first one will be the state of the art, to really get to know what does research say about the investments that have been done in the Arctic. Um, and of course, this is also a paper that I will come back to a bit later because it will involve a lot of eliminations and a lot of decisions to be made. How to search for this research, in which languages and in which areas? Is it Norway as an Arctic country or is it only the Arctic North? Or how do we actually decide? Could it be the whole of the Arctic circumpolarly? So I, I really need to decide on these topics and these things. And then it's the article two. And here I don't speak fluently Chinese myself, but what is also interesting to me is how do actually the Norwegian government and the Norwegian actors, the chambers of commerce again, and all these uh, innovation Norway, how do they work with Chinese investors to attract them? And what is the discourse in um, the media, for instance, about Chinese investments. Are they perceived in a positive way? Are they perceived uh, with skepticism? Do we want more investment <clears throat> from China and so on? I will try to get an insight into this. And then it's article number three, based on what we know from research and based on the Norwegian perspectives of Chinese investments. I would like to look into the concrete cases. So we've seen some interested investment cases in the Arctic, but what is actually the goal of these investments? Uh, do we see these actors that we identified earlier? Are they also involved in these investments? Like for instance, um, when uh, Chinese companies built uh, in Marvi, the bridge, a very, very big. How much it is with the fuel exploits are not changing in the street, so I don't think it was something like that. Okay, thank you so much for letting me know. Then I will double check what I'm doing wrong. Let me see, stop sharing. And start sharing again with the good idea. Screen one, share. And I'm sharing my screen now, I think. Is it working? Uh, right now, I would see. Uh, you, the camera, I don't see the presentation. Okay, then I'll try uh, something is happening now. Yes, we can see your presentation now. Okay. But, but we can see it in your mode, not the mode. So we see 
then I will try to do it like this and from the beginning. And then I'm going quick with the sites that I've already shown. Is it possible now? Now, now we just see the power point. Oh, then we will see. I'm so sorry, there are some issues then. And thank you so much for telling me on. So it's very good. 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 Very PowerPoint program of the slides. Can you try to share just with the screen and then you open the presentation and press follow? Okay, I can definitely try that. Let me see. Thank you so much for the suggestion. And then I'm going back to. Yeah, stop sharing. You're right here again. So, is modern technology wonderful? <laughs> it is. But it can make so many confusions. Share screen. <laughs> share screen. Screen number one and share. Yes. And then we still can listen from the beginning. Was it okay, please? Uh, <laughs> now I see your web browser. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. There sorry. it is. It's a few seconds away. Sorry. Yeah, That's there it is. Okay. Yeah, we, we can see your presentation. We can also see your notes. So, but both my notes, but the notes are not really <laughs> full of notes. notes. <laughs> so that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, I came to the concrete cases, didn't I? And then we want to see if the Chinese investments can somehow influence on the Arctic governance mechanisms. And this is, um, we've been thinking about using some theories about how influence actually work. Is it in a conversation? Is it in direct coercion? Is it how does actually influence work? And what are the governance mechanisms actually? And thank you so much, by the way, for the patience with the sharing of screens and so on. I appreciate it. That is a summary paper. It's called COPPA and it's mandatory. You need to, I need to make everything look in, look like the same kind of topic and the red thread going through the whole project. Yes, very, very good. Then it's methodology. Oh, yes. And basically, very quickly what I've said, uh, it will build on existing research knowledge and it will rely on the qualitative methods, uh, including interviews and documents, uh, studies as it says there. And of course, reaching um, Chinese investors and so on can be a bit challenging. Reason certain government authorities could also be a bit challenging and so on. But I will try my best and when accessible, I will interview experts and officials and company representatives. Um, and of course, this also demands quite uh, strict uh, ethical considerations when it comes to the data uh, management and so on. And trying to keep them anonymous anonymity of the people I'm interviewing, of course. And let me turn on the camera. Uh, and also with studying uh, the Norwegian perspectives uh, of on Chinese investments, uh, it is also studying uh, newspaper articles and so on. I mean, big uh, financial newspapers, I think I'll do. Uh, so a couple of those for the last 10 years or so. And now I'm going to article number one, because this is really where I would like to ask for your help. Um, it's still being planned. And the research question is, what is the current state of knowledge in the scientific literature on Chinese foreign investments in the Arctic published the last 10 years? And this is a big topic. So I, I can go about this in several ways. I can go into journals and go to each and every journal that's relevant for me. I think this is one way of doing it. Or go into databases and write and search for uh, the keywords that I would like to find out, uh, certain keywords. And I will identify them 
in the later slides. And that is um, going through the qualitative and quantitative of our course and summarizing. So it's a semi structured literature review uh, about that of these uh, journals. And then try to identify the investment drivers for actually investing in the Arctic. The characteristics, as I mentioned before, this relates directly to the research questions, the actors, and the governance mechanisms. I'm trying to find out exactly what those are. Here are a selection of journals uh, that I've identified that I would like to look through. Uh, one of them, as you can see, is also Norwegian. Uh, I'm considering only including English language journals, but perhaps also Norwegian is possible, of course. And this is one of the questions I will ask you later. If you know about any journals that could be relevant for investments in the Arctic, I would be really interested in knowing about them. Like good journals who wrote about this topic, because then I can go into that journal and I can look through all the published, uh, all the published work in these journals about the topic. And here are the keywords that I've been looking for. Uh, the list is getting longer and longer with each discussion I have, and I would like it to get even longer, I guess. And it's, uh, of course, China and investments. But then it's like Arctic and the high north and polar, which make uh, different nuances of the same topic, same place has lots of different definitions and different names. And then Antarctic, because China has been doing a lot of work also in the Antarctic, and there they can mention something about the Arctic, so I'll have to go through those as well. And it's the Polar Silk Road, and also Silk Road on Ice, and the Belt and Road Initiative, which are major investment uh, platforms or plans of the Chinese government, also now included in the Arctic. The Belt and Road Initiative was originally divided into two. Uh, you had the economic uh, economics maritime road, which was uh, coastal, which, which was the coastal way from China to, or the seaway from China to uh, Europe, going through uh, past Africa. And also it was the economic belt going across the uh, Eurasian continent. But then you have the Silk Road, the, the uh, and goes uh, the more as uh, Isilin showed it before. And then combining these terms with the geographic areas like Norway, Russia, Sweden, the Arctic countries, and also some sub areas of these countries, uh, which would be uh, Alaska, Greenland, the Barents region. Uh, Svalbard and the Northeast Passage, and so on. So, if you have any additional keywords that I should look into, an, an area that I haven't been thinking about, this would help me also a lot. This I mostly already covered with searching in scopes and selected journals, and also the research questions that they use, identify those what has actually research been interested in, uh, the theory supply, uh, the investment characteristics, the context, the method supply, the claims that these research papers have already made, and the findings of this research. And now it's the really the advice that I'm asking for, like if you have any thoughts about these words, and if you have any reflections on Chinese investments in the Arctic, uh, and if you have any interesting examples of Chinese investments that you've noticed that could help my, like, as a case, or that could help, me. I do have a list of some of the investments that have been made, but like, if you see some interesting details, something that could actually be interesting to look into in this study. So, thank you so much for helping me, or uh, listening to me, actually. And um, yeah, I could also thank for the help that I get. Yes. Thank you very much, Andres. Thank you. Questions, comments to others? Yes, please. So, oh, and, and, and load, because, uh, yeah, so if you're speaking a lot. Oh, um, <laughs> a question from Alaska. When you're talking about 
Arctic investments by the Chinese, I didn't see fisheries in there as um, <coughs> keywords. That would be something that from where I sit, it would be really interesting to see how they're doing. Maybe that investment is internally, but it's in the that can get this in those fishing rounds. Yes. That's a very interesting point. Thank you. And we're going to see a hand more. Yeah, yes. please. Um, so I was thinking about Chinese investments in other parts of the world, in particular in Africa, mm -hmm. and their investment in harbors or infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering um, if looking perhaps on some of the large scale investments that the Chinese have made elsewhere, it could help you with some of your search words. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second question was, have you thought about the attempted investments that were rejected? I'm thinking about, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it a proposal for uh, an airport? Was it the Chinese that proposed and that was rejected? So that's a, a failed attempt of an investment, um, but an indicator perhaps of Governance questions. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the airport was also I also think there's a mining project in the Indians that were on very on the question list or rejected. So I'll look into that. Thank you. Yes. Any questions from yeah, yeah, please, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> You said that you wanted to look into articles uh, from the last 10 years. So I was wondering why the last 10 years, why it's the last 100 years, for instance. Um, um, and also, I think uh, Svalbard uh, is uh, interesting. <laughs> That's what I'm writing about in my PhD. I think you can find uh, some interesting examples of Chinese investment there as well in research examples. Mm. Yeah. Um, I would say that the relationship has really developed in different phases for a long time. And uh, from 2011, it was after the financial crisis. It covers most of the period with Xi Jinping as a, as a Chinese leader and the new ways of, of or his ways of doing things. Uh, and it also covers the tough time with between Norway and China. And also it covers some of the major investments that have been done here in like Elkem, for instance around that time. So I'd like to go as far back as I can actually cover these very interesting projects. Um, so I found going shorter than 10 years would give a very limited scope, but going a little longer than 10 years would also make this very difficult. It would be very big. <laughs> so I tried to find the natural place of 10 years, but if some reason changes, if, if I see different reasons for extending this period. It could be, it could be fine. But I, I thought, okay, ten years sounds to me like a good way to stop. Yes. I came in late, so sorry if you already mentioned this, but uh, I, I know in the Faroe Islands that uh, China wanted to, well, Huawei wanted to build a five G network there, which I think got rejected eventually under pressure from Copenhagen. But that might also be something to take a look into. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, if I can make one suggestion and then ask mm -hmm. a question, if that's possible. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the suggestion, I guess, is, is this nitpicking <laughs> that you mentioned these journals that you're reviewing for, for the literature review. Uh, and since we're talking about investments, I guess another sort of source could be, you know, these think tank reports, reports in different kinds of economic, you know, like the Chambers of Commerce, etc. I mean, these are just sources that they're more difficult to track down because they're not indexed the same way as journals are, of course, but from experience, sometimes they contain more like they sort of they're more up to date in a way. They, they, they come out quicker than peer reviewed articles, and sometimes they have more interesting data. So that could be something also to look for. Uh, and I also just want to second this thing with the small bar. I guess like real estate investment, for example, is probably would be really interesting. But then you might also run into the issue of okay, then why think of in a 10 year period? Because mm. I mean, Chinese interest on Swalbar has sort of been going on for quite 20 years, maybe more. Um, and uh, yeah, my question was, and you mentioned it in the beginning, uh, 
So when you're talking about Arctic investment in a national context, so how do you sort of define what is Arctic investment? Mm. Right? So, so are you talking about investments happening happening geographically in you know northern Norway and you know, Norwegian Arctic, or are the investments that are from the Chinese side framed as specifically Arctic? So how do you how do you sort of define mm. what is considered an Arctic investment? Yes. Do you, you have an answer for that yet or not? I, I don't really have an answer more than I have an ongoing discussion. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So it's um, because if you, this project will look at how China contributes to Arctic governance mechanisms, right? Mm. And some mechanisms could origin from the Arctic region, while a lot of them are actually decided in the capital. So I mean, it's what is the Arctic mechanisms or what are what defines an Arctic investment, as you say, mm-hmm. when asking the same questions. Um, is it something about the environment around the investment? Is something about could it be environmental issues? Could it be social questions? Could it be indigenous questions? What what actually makes these investments different from the um, investments made in, in Africa, as you mentioned here before. It's like, so mm. it's really something to think about. And um, we have, yeah, we, we have an ongoing discussion, as I said, so yeah. it's a good question. Mm. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I don't have an answer myself, so I'm just interested <laughs> to, to hear if you, if you, if you had come up with this. Trying to, to develop it because investing in the Arctic makes, of course, a certain set of challenges, and also there are some um, there are some um, characteristics of the region. It's it's remote, often uh, hard with search and rescue. It's uh, less connected to the world and resource rich, and all these kind of things that actually make an Arctic investment kind of. But still, how to how to justify this delineation? I'm trying to decide on that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Uh, uh, thank you for all the, the questions. And uh, but the first article is about the state of the art from journals and the science. So so I, I think <coughs> the questions would be very interesting for your paper two or three. Can I have some questions from the panel actually? Okay, of course, we are very happy. So is it you, Isilin? Well, both of us. Um, well, uh, thank you, Amos. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you asked for reflections on investment. And um, so in 2012, 10 years ago, we began a project called the AC Arctic looking at, and not just China, but also Japan, South Korea, India, first of all, Singapore, and those interests for the Arctic. And expectations were high. Uh, I think if you look at the, some of the writings from 2000, well, I guess you have to go a little bit further than 2012, uh, around 2010. And um, I think you will find that the, the future we're living today, described 10 years ago, uh, a bit different. Uh, there were, yeah, great expectations, but uh, then less has materialized. Um, so it's good to have sort of a literature review of what uh, what the expectations were and sort of what people were following 10 years ago, but uh, uh, I really like the suggestion to sort of keep a list of failed attempts as well. Uh, and of course, uh, a list of what has actually been, been invested. Uh, and more a question, I guess, um, why are you limiting yourself to a few journals? Uh, I saw that you said that you were going to do um, search through Scopus. Uh, I think Google Scholar or Web or Science, just, I know you had tons of words, um, uh, of search words. So maybe, uh, so I don't know exactly sort of how many uh, hits you're getting, if it's in the thousands or in the hundreds. Um, and I've done this myself, sort of sifting through hundreds of articles and uh, it's a headache, but <laughs> uh, I, I'm, my, my gut feeling is that you wouldn't get that many hits. It would be maybe more than lower hundreds than several thousands. 
Um, so then you would have time to sort of quickly decide if it's uh, if it's worth sort of including in your literature review or not. Uh, yeah, so that's my suggestion. I wouldn't limit myself to a few journals, unless, of course, you you discover that sort of there's a debate in four or five journals. Um, um, then then tell me. I would be very interested. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments there, Celine. And um, I think. I think you're very right about the number of um, articles that I will find about this topic. It's, um, I think if, if I would look for Chinese investments in um, Indonesia or in Africa or, or in Australia, I think I would find a lot more articles than Chinese investments in the Arctic. So that's also why I, I would like, I've been considering doing this way that I'm searching in Scopus, for instance, in the big database, but also I'm going into a lot of single journals to see and if I can get one more, I'm happy. It's like this kind of, yeah, we have an expression in Norwegian, release or lykta, going really into the material to try to find, um, try to find something. So I think you're right, it's going to be in the lower hundreds, um, I'm quite sure. Uh, so, if there is something this databases can't reach or something, I would still like to find it. I think this was my approach. And also, uh, trying the snowball effects. Going through, like, finding one, see, okay, who referenced this article? Or... This just occurred to me now, and I know it's a lot of work, so take it or leave it, but... Um, maybe, I mean, if I were to choose, like, as you said, you chose some journals, but maybe you could choose, um, a couple of newspapers, uh, and just do searches, uh, for, I mean, you would probably need to know, but maybe Chinesisk or Chinese for the region, um, to just do searches because, you know, for things to get into peer-reviewed articles, it has to be kind of a big deal. Uh, and I think maybe uh, for uh, for a local newspaper or a national newspaper, uh, more rumors and stuff would would, would pop up, such as um, this Huang Nobo who tried to he first tried to buy land in on Iceland, right, and then he ended up buying something in, in Norway. Uh, I'm not sure you would find that much uh, written in in period articles on that, but it would probably actually get more uh from from just from newspapers um so uh, it's very tedious work but uh you if you have time doing your phd now maybe just set aside i don't know try for a week see what you get out of it um and then i mean i think your contribution a really large contribution to the scientific body is just sort of accumulating and then making lists of what has actually happened. And also, I mean, I support the failed attempts. Uh, that would also be <laughs> valuable knowledge. Uh, Thank you so much for your comments. And then I think it's fine, that's a question. Anish, a very interesting and very good presentation. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I would, uh, when I hear presentations like this, I always get, I always um, go into the role of a supervisor, really, mm -hmm. because I think the key element when doing a PhD is to be narrow, not too broad. Mm -hmm. And that's a key message. And I, uh, I think maybe you could, you, you, you say that you will write four articles. Maybe it's enough with three. And maybe the Arctic governance, uh, no, it's not <laughs> The regulations. Oh, it is. I thought it was three now. So, it, it but is. okay, okay. But uh, I think speaking with Islin, that's key because Islin has done a lot of work on these issues and has a lot of experience. So that's, listen to what Islin says. That's, that's, a, that's another message uh, uh, I would say. But looking at uh, cases, Maybe one idea could just look at cases from northern Norway, because there's a bunch of cases out there, hundreds really, uh, and initiatives that didn't succeed and so on. But uh, 
trying to narrow it down and look, well, this is what actually I'm looking at, Northern Norway. And that's that's enough for an article, really. Um, uh, and that's, uh, so th my key message really is to narrow it down. We could uh, have a chat over a beer later today, but uh, I think it has to be stressed all, all over and over again, because when in the beginning of a PhD, well, you want to answer all sorts of questions, but you have to bear in mind that it's a lot of work. So narrow it down. It makes it easier for you. Mm. Sounds like a very good advice. Sounds like <laughs> I, <laughs> make it easy for me. I, I like the idea. I've been um, going into only the cases in Northern Norway could perhaps be a way of... Um, making the field more more narrow since i'm looking into norwegian media and norwegian perspective in article two um only cases in article three that goes into norwegian investments could be the way to go yeah thank you uh, Sven. yes thank you anders um we have two questions to anders from the chat yeah but we take them later okay yeah, because otherwise we are running out of time because yeah, we take all uh chat questions we take them at the end so thank you anders thank you all the four articles so they will come then we continue and then next uh, and the last presentation is trim Eiterjur from the Arctic Institute and Trim, you are going to to present uh, the Arctic in China's 14 five years plan yes so great. the floor is yours thank you let's hope for less let's see if it works let's hope and let's also check uh before we see. yeah i do have a lot of notes in this discussion so it'll be nice if not everyone oh you open the pdf um, can we try with the EPT? Uh, I, I did both this in case. Very good. Uh, so, I think there should be a second. There we go. Yes. Let's try that. Then I'm just going to share those. I'll start sharing. This is what helps. This is the link for fine. Now let's just check from that. How does it look like on stream? Uh, right now we see the PowerPoint itself with a few seconds delay. No, oh, just like yours is, so it's working. It is working? Yeah. Oh, wow. cool. Okay, um, happy to be here in person. Uh, this is my first, this is happy to find to be able to present something in person. Uh, I'm a research associate at the, the Arctic Institute, which is this network of and mostly early career researchers and PhD students working on Arctic security issues, circumpolar issues. My sort of field is China. That's also uh, where I did my, so my, my bachelor's, master's. And then I'm an incoming PhD student at the University of British Columbia, probably working on uh, Chinese Arctic diplomacy, foreign diplomacy, geopolitics. Um, I'm attached to the working group three with Amish. We're looking at uh, this is a national Norwegian context, but the presentation now will be very much um, uh, related to what's on the screen right now, China's 14th fiber plan, which I'll explain in a second. Um, it will look more at maybe how Arctic is being, the Arctic is being conceptualized in China. So we go on to the international and the regional and the national, and now we're sort of arriving at China and how they're looking at the Arctic. Um, Yes. So uh, last year, uh, March 2021, the China's 14th Five Year Plan was adopted, the National People's Congress in Beijing. Um, this is uh, so. So these Five Year Plans are basically these huge economic and social development blueprints that are, as the name implies uh, or hints at, uh, they're adopted every five years, um, and they sort of set the stage for. Basically, they set a policy framework for all like, like subsequent policy making in China. Um, historically, they've been focused on domestic issues mainly. That's still the main focus of these plans. Um, 
that's China's sort of role as a, you know, as, as China's aspirations as a global power uh, and its interests have become more global, foreign policy and, and these more, you know, uh, well, international and global issues have sort of uh, received more attention. And the 14th fiber plan is special in, in our case because that, this is the first time that the Arctic sort of got an explicit mention in the plan. So in chapter 33 of the plan, um, Excuse me, can you close that pop-up that appeared? Uh, is there a pop-up? Pop yeah, the system tells you to restart. Uh, should not restart. No, right? please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try the other one. Yeah. Um, I will be, yeah. yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. So in chapter 43 of this, uh, the most recent plan, uh, there's a chapter on global maritime governance and the developing the, sort of the blue economy. Um, and this is, um, this is uh, this is a paragraph. This is a section, which is this is my translation. It's an it's an older translation, but it's now an official translation out. I think so. I should probably rely on that one, but it should be pretty accurate. I've sort of highlighted the important things. So it calls for China to deepen participation in national open governance, promote creation of a maritime community with a shared future, which is a very sort of um, it's a more recent uh, concept that's been developed in Beijing. Uh, very nebulous concept, I would say. Um, and then the important part, uh, which is further down here, participate in practical cooperation in the Arctic and build a policy of both. Um, and this, um, this again, the significance is the first time this has happened. So it's a sign of uh, that the Arctic has become sort of, there's a more sophisticated policy making in Beijing, most likely, uh, in terms of how it thinks of the Arctic in a sort of its larger foreign policy framework. Uh, should, however, be important. Should, however, try not to overstate how significant this is. This is a document that is almost 150 pages long, and the Arctic is mentioned once. So, uh, but still, um, if you look historically, there are uh, other regional areas, other like international issue areas, or or or, or, or regions where China has interest. They're rarely mentioned, but the Arctic is mentioned. Um, and what I'll focus on now is sort of why this is important, and mainly it's not about. Uh, again, it's not about how often it's mentioned in the plan, but the context that it's mentioned in. Um, so as, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is a section looking at the global maritime governance, um, which, um, uh, which sort of will tell you that China is increasingly seeing the Arctic as a maritime space. It's not a surprise. I think most people will realize that it is uh, uh, a maritime space. Someone called it the Mediterranean. Uh, but it emphasizes the areas of dark that belong in the global commons. And it emphasizes sort of um, its own position as something who <coughs> is a country that can engage with the Arctic to these international legal regimes uh, and into different global governance mechanisms, law to sea mainly. Um, and uh, this comes from, uh, this is very big by the this one. I should have uh, scaled it down a bit, but you know, this is, I, I, I set this up for soon, so. Um, and uh, this sort of comes again from this more recent, again, conceptualization in Beijing of strategic new frontiers, which is a, so the second point here, um, where China is focusing on areas, the polar regions, outer space, cyberspace, and the deep sea, which is, you know, we would usually think of these as global commons or uh, uh, areas that are beyond, you know, national jurisdiction. Um, in China, they're sort of talked about in this new strategic frontiers way, which implies from the regions that are done so far would imply that they're thinking of how can we, instead of instead of not only sort of following the rules that are already set up in these places, uh, in these regions, the, the norms and the rules here are very much in flux. So how can we as a, you know, as a rising power, as an increasingly global power, sort of try to embed ourselves more and, and, and and not necessarily rewrite the rules, but influence the rules to further our own interests, which is, of course, not unique to China, but China being the power that it is, it's important to pay attention to what they're doing and what they're thinking. And as I, as I mentioned here, reflects this also reflects changes in Beijing's stated approach to maritime governance in general. Um, so if you compare the, these different five-year plans, if you compare the current one to the previous one that was adopted in 2016, um, it told, that plan talks about maritime governance in a much more regional way, talking about how China can defend its maritime interests in East Asia and in South, Asia, uh, South China Sea. Um, while the current one talks about maritime governance much more in a global way. So it talks about how China can sort of engage 
uh, the international community uh, basically everywhere. Um, slide. And then to move to the second point, um, uh, it also mentioned the, the, the plan also mentioned the policy growth. Um, and so what I've done for this region, I, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but this is all based on a paper that I'm finalizing uh, or potentially two papers, sort of how it pans out. It depends on how it pans out, um, which the, the, the paper itself looks at uh, basically how the Arctic is being used in these new plants and, um, and how references to the Arctic are changing, what context they appear in. Um, and one important thing that I found is that, so you have this plan that was adopted last year, after that, you have uh, provincial governments, you have city, like local governments, you have different ministries, they all develop their own plans, like their own sort of more smaller, more specialized fiber plants. Um, and what you're seeing now is that these plants are also, again, including mentions of the Arctic, including, including mentions of the polar silk road. Um, and so what I've included on this slide and this table is different provinces that so far that I've found have included uh, the Arctic in their own sort of plans for the next five years. And I've sort of tried to, just, this is very simplified and uh, this is ongoing research, but sort of try to just sketch the different topics that they focus on. Um, so you have uh, Heilongjiang and Jilin and Yaoning, these three first provinces, which are looking at, uh, looking at uh, cross-border cooperation. These are countries that border Russia, the Russian Far East, in Jilin's case, it's also borders North Korea, uh, which is also somehow part of this polar civil coalition in some cases. Um, Liaoning is a, it's a, it's a major port city in northern China. So these look at cross-border cooperation, shipping, and in the first and third case there, they look at research. And research then is in terms of developing Arctic-related technologies. So nuclear icebreakers, these what they call a polar search and rescue platforms, which are these you know, both vessels and systems to sort of ensure better certain rescue capabilities in like polar waters. Um, and then you have uh, problems like Shandong, where you have uh, well, uh, Qingdao, which is one of the uh, one of the major cities in that province, has you know for decades or for decades by now uh, been this sort of very uh, central kind of Arctic gateway in China. So it's already cemented itself as a sort of important city for China when engaged with the Arctic and sort of try to develop this policy for vision. And it also focuses on manufacturing, for example, like uh, these liquefaction modules for the Yamal LNG and now Arctic LNG two. And then Shanghai, which is of course this science hub for, for Chinese polar research, uh, so, yeah, for Chinese polar research. Um, and so what you see is that there's differing, different subnational interpretations and niches. So there's different provinces, they have different economic niches, they are different, so they're situated differently geographically. And so they engage with the policy world in different ways. And sort of what I try to get out, uh, and the argument that I will make in the paper is that. Um, and which I, which, and this is still research that is ongoing. So uh, this is again more of a hypothesis. Um, is that these provinces, uh, having seen that the policy as a sort of a foreign policy slogan, you know, which appeared in Beijing, which appeared in the, uh, as easily mentioned, you know, in 2017 uh, during the state visit to Russia, um, then again in the Arctic uh, white paper in 2018. They've seen this sort of, again, this slogan, and they're thinking, okay, this is a way for us to sort of get kind of access to funding, get access to resources, and sort of take part in this policy. Flow. It's especially really uh, relevant for these top three provinces here, which are below, uh, are in the Chinese Northeast. It's a very sort of economically depressed region, um, and uh, you know, you have provincial governments, local governments looking for other ways to sort of you know. Uh, work on uh, cross-border trade, economic development, and also like a, a economic integration in Northeast Asia, which the Polar Silk Road, uh, uh, or which, is, which has become an increasingly big component of the Polar Silk Road, uh, from, from at least from what I've seen from the literature, literature that I've been reviewing. Um, and then my last point uh, goes to the strategic science and technology. So um, this is sort of the research that I've been mostly involved in, uh, trying to look at uh, so when this research group that we're all a part of are looking, is looking at Arctic governance, uh, the sort of question that I've had is, okay, what is the sort of infrastructure for this governance? So how can China contribute expertise, knowledge, uh, and, and different forms of scientific or transport infrastructure to take part in Arctic governance or have a say in Arctic governance? So I've sort of been interested in looking at uh, how it develops its scientific base, its technological base, um, and how this relates to the Arctic. Um, 
this is another sort of first for this current 14 five-year plan. And this is that it's the first time that they're allocating funding earmarked for polar technologies. Um, and it's especially sort of focusing on serving and monitoring Arctic water base, waterways. So Arctic is trying to develop uh, satellite systems, uh, navigation systems, communication systems to sort of uh, uh, to basically promote the development of Arctic shipping. Um, one of the previous presentation mentioned this uh, satellite that will go up uh, this year, I guess, was to plan this synthetic aperture radar satellite, which is uh, some of what they mentioned here, um, which will give China sort of the ability to to for to do ice char LA sort of sea ice forecasting in, uh, in much more sort of advanced ways than it's currently doing. Uh, and the rhetoric in all of these plans is that they're trying to catch up with the Arctic countries. Um, but they're also focusing on self-reliance in the sense that, you know, not only do we want to develop these technologies because we want to sort of, you know, work in the Arctic, but we also want to develop them, especially satellites, because we don't want to rely on American satellites, for example. Um, and just focusing on this catching up point uh, as kind of conclusion, um, I was thinking, uh, listening to Celine's presentation about the polar cold, uh, research that I've done previously, which looked at the polar cold and sort of the rhetoric or sort of the discourse uh, on Chinese polar, the China, sort of the Chinese discourse on the polar cold. Um, that's very much been that, okay, uh, this is something that we would like to participate in, but we don't really have the expertise and the knowledge to do it. Um, and this is making us sort of exposed to other countries, usually, you know, mainly Arctic countries, but also countries like Germany, for example, who have more experience and they can be more assertive uh, in negotiation and deliberations in the IMO, for example. Uh, and this is something that is repeated in these plans as well, uh, not in the polar cold context, but just in the sense that uh, we want to promote, uh, we want to catch up technologically because that will give us a, a, an edge basically when, 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 when things like Arctic shipping become, well, if it becomes more of an issue. Um, and I, I think uh, I'll maybe add some, I'll cut it a little bit short since I see that where I have basically 30 seconds left. Um, <laughs> So I have one more slide, but it's fine. Uh, I can just conclude by saying that this is again based on a paper uh, that I'm developing, uh, and it's uh, trying to see, not trying to sort of forecast what China is trying to do in the next five years with this plan, which is coincidentally when our project will wrap up. Sorry, sorry, um, but looking at how just how it sort of how it views its own position in the Arctic, and especially with this slide, uh, how these more like Again, this was mentioned previously, like how these things that you usually don't think about, like, for example, do you have like the venues to host Arctic conferences and include, uh, you know, participants from, from everywhere? Uh, like these very minute details that sort of make up the infrastructure of governance. Uh, these are questions that are question, questions that I'm very interested in. Sorry. Uh, and again, I'm looking uh, at, you know, this science technology uh, as a way to explore these questions. So, okay, what are the sort of What's the sort of uh, physicality of like of these different like uh, governance, like these institutions, and how China participates? You know, how does it contribute data, expertise, and knowledge? Um, and uh, a last point, which is just a methodological point, I guess, which I sort of would suggest to other people, is that I think one issue with studying China in the Arctic right now is that you do see that there's a lack of activity at the moment. I mean, uh, sort of after the white paper in 2018. Uh, sort of things that sort of rolled back a little bit. And now with Arctic Council uh, being on pause and with COVID, um, if this is a question that you're interested in, it, it doesn't seem like that much is happening. But if you do look at how they're investing in technology and science in the Arctic, then a lot of stuff is happening, especially <laughs> when you look at the development of, of maritime technologies in the Arctic, so icebreakers, for example. Uh, which is which has become an increasingly big focus, and uh, I think I'll conclude with that. That sounds good. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Two trends. Yeah. Any questions? I, I, yeah, maybe I could start. I, I remember that we, we have been discussing. China in the High North Dialogue Conferences many times. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, and, and the High North Dialogue Conferences have gone on for 15 years or something like that. And, 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 and you said something at the end that 
Maybe. The, the, the interest seems to be more focused, as I understand you, it's more issues, technology, the sea base, and so on. But at the same time, less activities have taken place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you close to any kind of other any debates in, in, in China that you are following, saying something about the Arctic, whether, whether you could see that it is not so hot on the uh, on the agenda. Mm. Uh, the, the reason why I'm asking that is, I think, four or five years ago, we had a discussion about that in, in the Hainan dialogue. And there were two from China that became, uh, yeah, they had different opinions because one was saying that they had, yeah, all this was maybe in the Arctic, uh, 18, yeah, 2018, mm. um, that, of course, political interest was there, but you always said, there was, there was no real interest in. I, th that is my suspicion mm. of what they said. And I think the, the, the question that you posed to me of sort of uh, what the interests, like if sort of the, the level of interest now in Beijing, for example, that's very much something that I would like to answer to. It's hard to tell. I mean, uh, there is definitely a growing sort of community of Chinese experts in, uh, in China. Uh, again, if you look at scientific research, it's expanding, different like polar institutes, uh, Arctic institutes, etc. Um, but how, but how this is discussed, sort of again in Beijing on sort of this sort of the uh, high political level. My suspicion is that it's fairly peripheral. Uh, when it comes to things relating to Russia, that's different. When it comes to things relate, uh, relating to the U.S. and NATO, for example, and how that relates to the Arctic, that is different. But um, but when it comes to sort of again being a stakeholder in the Arctic, which is uh, uh, which sort of, uh, sort of came to a head with this uh, 2018 white paper. I, it does sound like that is <coughs> become less of a focus. There was uh, uh, there was a, a sort of a prominent uh, Chinese sort of Arctic expert who wrote I mean, two years ago about sort of how we should expect less Chinese activity in the Arctic going forward. And there has been talks of sort of an Ar Arctic policy 2.0 in a sense, and there has been this sort of debates, not necessarily in China, but uh, around like people who are watching China and the Arctic, this debate whether or not yeah, China should, should sort of recalibrate its policy towards the Arctic, focus more on environmental issues and sort of you know uh, skip all this, this shipping stuff for example. And that's another thing that pe probably people know here that shipping has there was a lot of hype around shipping, but now it's sort of it's more depressed. Mm -hmm. um, so so I don't know. My suspicion is that we'll see less sector, but. Uh, but uh, again, the, the question that you're asking is something that I'm, you know, investigating at the moment. So we'll see what I find out. And I, and I used to say, even though if it's less interest, there are quite many Chinese people <laughs> and Chinese researchers. Yeah. So still, there will be some who are interested. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> again, it's China, so you should always keep an eye out. So that's uh, right. important. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I have a question related to uh, the uh, rhetorics uh, that was uh, of China to the Arctic, but uh, because. I have an impression that China and other countries trying to build up this image of Arctic being some, somehow low like vacuum, that there's mm -hmm. no regulations that they can do whatever they want in the, in the Arctic because there is no regulations. Whether uh, and on the other hand, Oslo, for instance, is trying to really uh, say loudly that everything is regulated. We have the law of the sea and uh, the Convention of the Sea and everything. So, do you have the impression that China is? trying to push this, this rhetorics that there actually is a vacuum, there is a possibility to do something there in, in the Arctic that not everything is regulated, also in the context of maritime activities, for instance. Um, not to the, the extent that sort of the way you phrase it, that there is like that, that they think of it as lawless in any way. I, I pushed it maybe a bit, but, yeah, uh, but, but I mean, just but, uh, to get a point, because yeah. I think also France is uh, a few years ago, they, they had the same rhetorics that not everything is regulated in the Arctic. I mean, it is, I think this seems to be an issue that is not unique to China. Again, I think a lot of uh, Arctic governments will sort of, you know, try to like, they will rip their hair out when they hear about how, you know, more Southern capitals with Southern media, like in, in non-Arctic countries talk about how the Arctic is this sort of opening up this like resource bonanza or whatever, you know, kind of a scramble for the Arctic. Um, that's been the case in China too, but I think if you're talking to the people who, who again are working on these issues on the professional level and who are making policies, so I would assume they're very much aware of sort of the, the, the legal and sort of uh, institutional kind of architecture of the Arctic and, and how everything is very much 
um, uh, under control in a way. I think um, if you look at some of the things that are published, there is this opposite fear that the, the Arctic is being carved up, uh, that it is being a, a recent paper that I was reading, uh, someone wrote about how the Arctic is being privatized so that they're afraid that you know, Arctic countries, you know, this is something that came up you know, after this Russian flag campaign in uh, 2007, mm -hmm. sort of going up uh, and then when countries started to ramp up their like continental shelf mapping and all that stuff. Um, the concern there is that that they think that sort of this this China with like sort of Arctic, which is sort of the view as a cake or a melon or something, being carved up, right? And in the end, this this you know, for example, the Central Arctic Ocean and sort of what belongs to the global commons, as they say, uh, is disappearing, right? But then you can argue that these like some of these arguments or some of these suspicions are sort of they're based on you know they're based on the wrong premise, you know, it's sort of you know some of these you can read some of these these papers or some of these these offers they do. Um, they do sort of operate with, with, with factually wrong you know, data in a way, they have a wrong impression. Uh, so again, if, if I think if you look at the people who are working very closely uh, with Arctic issues and who are exchanging a lot with, with Arctic researchers you know, here or other places in the Arctic, they're, they're much more on the level of like, you know, uh, this, this is the sort of institutional architecture of the Arctic and this is how it works. Uh, but there are still people who, who uh, do publish and who do see the Arctic as being sort of again carved up by the Arctic states, and there's nothing left for sort of you know this common heritage of mankind, as they will call it. Yeah. Uh, so I think to your question, it's sort of a sort of yes, you know, like uh, there is this kind of rhetoric, but not in a not, not in that extreme sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Trim. If there are no other questions, I can say that the expectation of uh, Anders has not really been uh, so fulfilled because he said we will have plenty of time <laughs> and we have just eight minutes left. Wow. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> then, Mona, you mentioned that there, there are questions in the chat. Yes, we have questions for both the last panelist and Anders. We can start with yours, Anders. Uh, it's a question from New One. Uh, from Amber University and the Arctic Center, University of Lapland, he would like to ask Anders if, when you're speaking with Chinese foreign investment in the Arctic, uh, the key concepts are in the project, how do you define foreign investment concisely? Only FDI, or also in, do you include FDI? Because these two types of foreign investment have really different interests in general. Are, are there two Christians to understand? We take both. Okay, uh, and the yeah, other because is because you don't have much time. Okay, and the other is do you focus only on China's Arctic investments that have actually been realized in Finland? There have been many plans, but most of these have not been implemented. Maybe you could include Lapland in your keywords and look at the Arctic yearbook as well. Okay, so thank you so much about the types of investments. Uh, we were discussing in the beginning FDI, uh, defined as. Uh, cross-border investment with 10% ownership at least, uh, which will make uh, uh, long-lasting investment uh, for control of the company somehow. Um, but then I think after honestly taking part in a course on international investments uh, in Copenhagen, I um, think that I would like to look into uh, other types of investment as well. It could be green fields, it could be um, new stuff, which is the establishment of business in, uh, in the Arctic. It could be uh, sales office representation, it could be um, uh, partnerships, it could be. Um, we've, we've also looked, taken the definition of investment really far and said that. Okay, if you devote resources to something to achieve a goal, uh, like for instance, developing partnerships in educa educa education, or if you invest resources into uh, developing regional cooperation with Mulan County Council, it could also be an investment. So this is also something very much still open, I would say, but if, if it's only the devotion of resources for long-term objectives, or if it's FDI strictly for a direct investment business, or if it's something in between. I am still also thinking about this 
too many open questions at the moment. The second part was um, about I yeah, know. yes, including Finland. Yeah. Yes, um, with the advice Lapland. Lapland as a search term uh, for looking for my articles could be definitely an idea. As, as I've done Greenland and as I've done Nordland and Finland, I'm sure it could also be Lapland. Um, so this is a good idea. Um, I also like before the comment I got about perhaps focusing mostly on Norway when writing about cases, since we do have some cases here. But uh, of, of investments, it could be Elkem, it could be Hologlansbrua, it could be uh, um, the development perhaps that is ongoing of cooperation with Marivi Calvin, uh, for instance, in shipping. Uh, port infrastructure. Um, so if I find the case in Norway, perhaps this would actually be the best way to proceed for me. Uh, but also looking into what has been done, what has not been done, as we said before, the failed attempts. Uh, as you mentioned in Lapland, there are failed attempts at Chinese investments, and this is also very interesting to look into. Uh, so many opportunities. And <laughs> thank you for the advice uh, about looking into Lapland. In yes. Very good. Thank you. And then the next question to you. Uh, oh. Yeah. What do you think about future collaboration between China and Russia in the Arctic, especially concerning the use of the NSR? How much will this be affected by the ongoing war? Hmm. Uh, big, uh, a very big question. I recently published like a, a short sort of hot take on this question. And I think one of the immediate things that I thought of when 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 the sanctions were rolled out at the beginning of, 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 of the war in Ukraine was that okay? Um, this um, it would make sense to have uh, that shipping activity along the NSR would sort of increase. Um, I guess I don't know if people can hear me anymore. Yeah, there we are. Um, <laughs> if there was more LNG being shipped from the Russian Arctic to China. And then you will probably now you'll see more oil and gas being shipped to India as well and using the NSR. But something that you see when you look at uh, well, some Chinese discussions is very much this. Uh, um, this they, they have a very ambivalent attitude towards the NSR. I mean, you know, they have to, I guess, um, deal with the NSR when it comes to, for example, these LNG projects that they that they that they have stakes in that state-owned companies have stakes in, but uh, when you see sort of how they, when researchers, for example, are developing uh, concepts for new vessels and looking at like uh, route planning in the Arctic, sorry, um, they do look at routes that will sort of circumvent the NSR. So how can we sort of get from Bering Strait to the Norwegian Sea, for example, or to 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 to, to Russian sort of um, western ports? Uh, without necessarily going, you know, through the Kara Gate and all that stuff, um, and whether those are for economic reasons or trying to circumvent uh, sort of this the, uh, Russia's sort of regulation of the NSR, I'm not sure. I mean, there was this uh, there was this Chinese sailboat, sort of state-sponsored sailboat, last year, uh, which tried to sail, you know, the NSR and then the Northwest Passage, but it was stopped. But like, I mean, they they tried to sort of get through without permits and they failed. Uh, they finally got permits to get through the NSR, and then they made the same mistake uh, in the Northwest Passage with Canada, and they would turn around. And uh, uh, it somehow looked like they were just trying to see if that regime was sort of working. That they so can we sail through here or not, um, or do or yeah. So there are sort of these. Uh, obviously, it would be disastrous for sort of the relationship in the Arctic to to to. To, to, to disagree on sort of how the NSR is, is regulated and how the Northeast Passive is regulated. But I think in the long term, China would like to avoid the NSR. So, um, and I guess the future sort of for Arctic shipping in general is pretty much up in the air. Uh, it's hard to, LNG will be one thing, sort of destination of shipping from Russia to, to, to East Asia, not to Europe anymore. Um, but apart from that, I mean, uh, it's, who knows? It could be zero, yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you all. You have one minute. Yeah, we, we will, we will, I will just thank you for coming, for participating, and also those of you who are at uh, over on the conference platform.
there should be 50, 60 people that have been, been uh, uh, registered for this uh, uh, side event. So thank you. There are a lot of other side events coming on today and some tomorrow morning. So I hope that you could uh, join some of them and also be in the conference at 12 tomorrow. So thank you very much. And especially thank you to you, Iselin, and to Svein and Anders and Trim who made these presentations. So thank you very much.